Tonight we're going to kind of get back to our, our normal series that we're doing for the semester, looking at the parables of Jesus, if you recall. These are stories that Jesus told that illustrate truth, right? And so we're unpacking those this semester. We're going to unpack one of those tonight. Before we get into our parable for the night, if you had to describe what our culture right now, right here in America, in 2021 values, in a word, what do you think you'd choose? Okay. Freedom, good. There's a lot of things we could say, right? We really value equality, we really value diversity, uh, we really value happiness. But freedom is probably a pretty good choice, right? We really value everyone having the freedom to exercise their rights, right? And so we believe that everybody has rights and everybody should be able to exercise those rights and have freedom, right? That's like the ideal we strive for as a culture, right? You guys are Yeah. Okay. So if we really value freedom, what does that mean exactly? What are we free to do what? To do anything. <laughs> to do anything. Yeah. Okay. Free to do what we want, right? Like I said, free to exercise our rights. You know, we had in the foundation of our country, the, you know, the founding fathers said the rights to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you know, like those sorts of things. Uh, you know, so we really believe in this idea of freedom and of, of people having rights. And God helps somebody if they violate my rights, right? But as we get started, here's another question for us to just kind of mull over, just to think on, okay? What rights does God have? Okay. And then how do His rights and our rights intersect? Okay, so what rights does God have? Got a little quiet there, that's cool. All right. So let's go ahead and get into our parable for tonight. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. We're going to start at verse 33. It says, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Okay, let's pray. Jesus, we love you, Lord. God, would you help us to uncover the truth that you have put in your scripture and your word and the truth that you illustrated in this story, Lord. Love you, Jesus. You know we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so this is kind of a bit of a dark parable, right? <laughs> it's kind of intense. And so Jesus kind of ends this parable with this question, right? What should this landowner do with these tenants? And so these guys are killing people, they're beating people. I mean, they're, they're pretty bad guys, right? Like, that's pretty crazy. And why are they doing all of this stuff? Why are they, like, killing all these people, doing all these things? Well, to put it simply, they don't want to give the landowner what they owe him. Right, so this guy owns this land. He did all the work to get it set up to be able to have a harvest. And then he hired these guys to work it for him. Right? And so they get wages, they get to live on the land, and they're supposed to give him the harvest. Right? And so then when he sends some of his other guys who get the harvest, they don't want to give it. And so they kill those guys, and then he sends more guys, and they kill those guys. And then finally he says, listen. They'll listen to my son. They'll respect him. Because he represents me. And he sends his son, and they kill his son. Why? To take his inheritance, to take what's rightfully his. That's pretty crazy, right? I mean, gee, what kind of guys are these? I mean, so imagine like you were like a manager, right, for like a store or a restaurant or something, and just try to try to picture the worst employees you could possibly imagine having, right? Like, they'd probably be, like, super lazy. Maybe they, they're late. They just don't show up sometimes. They'd probably be super rude. They wouldn't listen. But killing people? 
by killing their co-workers? I mean, that's, that's a little extra, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a bit much. Like, it almost feels unrealistic. You know, like, it almost feels like, this, there's no way this could be a real scenario. Like, imagine, you know, working at the store and, like, your employees are killing each other. Like, that's crazy, right? But Jesus tells this story, and he's illustrating something. At this point, most of us are probably, like, thinking, okay, it's time to, like, you know, let's get John Wick on these dudes. Send in the SWAT team, send in whoever. Get them out of there. Kill them if you need to. And that's what the people listening thought, too, in, in verse 4. It says, they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Kill those wretches. That's <laughs> what they deserve, right? I mean, these guys are murderers. This is crazy. They even kill his very son. Like I said, it seems hard to fathom this scenario in real life. But Jesus is illustrating something. He's illustrating actually a couple of things. The first thing he's really illustrating here is he's trying to paint a picture of the history of humanity yeah. as a whole. Okay, so our entire race of people, right? See, God made mankind. He made people, male and female, in his image he created. And he gave us everything we have. He made this earth that was so perfect for us to thrive. He gave us all the opportunities we have. He gave us life and sustains us. We're like tenants in his provision. And he made us for relationship with him. But mankind rejected him and rebelled against him. And so he sent prophets and he sent leaders, and by and large, mankind rejected them, beat them, even killed them. And then what happens? Well, finally, Jesus himself, the only son, comes down among us. Divinity incarnate. And what does mankind do? <coughs> Crucify him. So the question at the end of the parable could be turned this way. What should God do with mankind? It's a bit more uncomfortable, isn't it? But that's only the first level of the parable. Speaking to the collective, the whole of mankind, our history. See, so the parable doesn't stop there. It actually speaks to each and every one of us personally. Now, we mentioned before how, as Americans, you know, we're all about freedom, we're all about liberty, we're all about our rights. But what does that mean? That we want to be able to do what we want, right? That's what we value. We want everybody to be able to do what they want. I mean, we have some limits, right? Like, don't hurt anybody, and don't, you know, violate anybody else's rights. But other than that, generally speaking, do what you want, right? You do you. Right? And we see this same attitude in Israel in the Old Testament. If you go to the book of Judges, verse 21, uh, chapter 21, verse 25, it said, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. And you can say that our culture must be able to do what's right in their own eyes. Now we find this verse in Judges, this is the last verse in the book, and it's describing the cultural landscape at the time uh, of Judges. And, you know, this verse actually follows some pretty crazy stories of just absolute wickedness. So basically, to kind of give you a quick flyover of what precedes this verse, right? Um, so there's 12 tribes in Israel, one of them is the tribe of Benjamin, and one of Benjamin's cities, this absolutely horrible, terrible thing. I don't really even want to say exactly what it is. But this horrible, horrible thing happens. Like, unspeakably awful wickedness happens. Okay? And then the rest of Israel hears about it. And they get all enraged. And they're mad. Because this is awful. And they all take this oath saying, you know what? None of us will allow any of our daughters to marry any of their sons. Right? Like, we will no longer intermarrying with Benjamin, okay? Which is bad news for Benjamin because they need to marry people to continue to exist. Um, and so, a little bit later is, you know, all the people of Israel, they kind of cool off a little bit. They're like, well, we don't want Benjamin to just, like, cease to exist because they're one of the 12 tribes. We want them to go on. And so, and the, the men of Benjamin are like, what should we do? And so they're like, okay, listen, there's this village over here, 
right? They're going to have this festival, okay? And in this festival, you need to do is you just need to wait. Just kind of hide and wait. And all of the young women are going to come out and dance in this festival. And when they do, just run out there and grab one and take them and she'll be your wife. And that's what they do. So they, they literally go kidnap women to be their wives. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> and then the people of the village are all mad, of course. And, and then the men of Israel are like, it's okay, it's okay, you didn't violate your oath. All right? like, you didn't give them to them, so it's, it's cool, it's cool. And, and they're like, okay, so Benjamin will keep going. And, so that's, and then it's like, they did what was right in their own eyes. All right? It's pretty crazy. And this is the idea we see in our culture today. That everyone should be able to do what's right in their own eyes. I mean, we have a right to that, don't we? Don't we have a right to what we want? And we tend to tell ourselves, you know, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I don't really hurt anybody. I deserve this thing, right? I deserve this thing I want. But what makes a good person? What makes somebody a good person? What's the standard? Because when you say, if we say, you know, I'm a good person, or they're a good person, we're appealing to some standard of goodness. So what is the standard of goodness? Now, a lot of people in our society would kind of say there isn't really a standard. But we kind of live... But I think the standard we tend to live by is don't hurt people, right? That's what you tend to see in our culture. Just don't hurt anybody, okay? As long as you don't hurt anybody, as long as you don't hurt anybody, it's all good. You do what you want to do, as long as you're not hurting anybody, then you're good. Okay, but do we live up to that? Have any of us ever, like, never, ever hurt anybody? And maybe we're not violent. But that's not the only way to hurt people, right? I mean, have we ever broken a heart? Or broken a trust? Maybe said something cruel? We've all hurt people, right? So if that's our own standard, we don't really live up to that. But what about God? Have we hurt Him? What does that mean? Now, you know, a lot of people tend to read the Bible. And they tend to think, you know, the Bible's just a list of rules. It's just all these rules in it. And we tend to think of these rules as if they were like arbitrary things. Kind of like, like the speed limit, right? It's like, damn that. The speed limit's 35, right? And what I mean by arbitrary is that whoever made the decision to make the speed limit 35 could just as easily have made it 30 or 40. They didn't have to be 35, right? Somebody just was like, ah, let's just set it at 35. That sounds good. But it could have been something else, right? And we tend to think, you know, God set his rules this way, but he, it could have been something else. Like, he could have made them different if he wanted to. It's kind of arbitrary. And yeah, I mean, they're the rules. We should follow them, whatever. But, but it's, you know, it could have been this. It could have been that. Sometimes we wish it was this or that. But that's not actually what God's laws are like. So God's laws are actually two things. Let me go over this real quick. Uh, so God's laws, first, are a description of reality. Uh, so, a better analogy for God's laws than a speed limit would be the law of gravity, which said that if I go and run off of a cliff, then I'm going to accelerate towards the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared, and when I hit the ground, it's going to exert a force upon my body that will probably not feel very good. Okay? I can't break the law of gravity. If I try, it will break me. Okay? Like, I can break the speed limit. Maybe I can get away with it, but I can't break the law of gravity. And God's laws are descriptions of reality. He made us. He knows what we need. He knows how we work. And when he says this, he says, hey, don't, don't jump off that cliff. Because he knows what it leads to. Does that make sense? And beyond that, they're descriptions of reality. They're also descriptions of his character. They're descriptions of him. So, for example, when we read in the Bible, do not commit adultery, it's also saying to us, God is faithful. Yeah. Yeah. And he will never, ever be unfaithful. And so we should also be faithful. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when we break these rules, we break ourselves, but we also break a heart. Yeah, that's we break his heart. And all of the sin and selfishness in our lives hurts our Father. So going back to the question, what's the standard of goodness? If it's don't hurt people, we don't really live up to that, if we're honest. 
But is that even what the standard really is? I mean, that's kind of what our culture likes to live by. Does our culture decide what good is? Who decides what good is? God does. So what is the standard? Well, like we just said, God's laws and descriptions of his character. The standard is God. God is good. Do we live up to that? I don't think so. I mean, who among us lives up to God? Perfect, glorious, holy God. Like Paul said in Romans, we all fall short. And when we do what's right according to our own eyes, like our culture wants to do, we actually end up always hurting those around us. Even though we like to say, you know, don't hurt anybody, we always do. I mean, really, look at our society. Look at it. It holds up this idea. It holds up this standard. Do what you want, but don't hurt anybody. Like you can get in relationship with whoever you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as everybody's you know, in agreement on the same page. It's all good. But then our divorce rate is over 50%. And how many broken families are there in our society right now? How many broken homes? You know, the alcoholism and all these things that come from people making selfish choices. Doing what they want to do. When we do what's right in our own eyes, we always hurt those close to us. Is this really the way to live? You know, we get so caught up thinking of our own rights, and making sure that our own rights are not violated. But do we ever think about God's rights? What does he deserve? What does God deserve? Well, to put it simply, everything. <laughs> he deserves us. He deserves us. He deserves all that we are. See, God has a right to our lives. He has a right to us. And there's several reasons he has a right to us. First of all, like I said, he made us. He created us. Psalm 139, 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Quite simply, we wouldn't exist without him. And everything we have is from him. He made this perfect planet that's perfect for us to live on. He gave us families. He gave us people to be around. He gave us opportunities. He gave us abilities to see and to talk and to Everything that we're able to do, every opportunity we have, the very air we breathe, he's given to us. If you're sitting in this room, you're blessed by God. Yeah. Every one of us is blessed because he made us and he sustained us and he gave everything to us. The Bible uses the analogy of calling God the potter and we're the clay. He made us and that gives him a right to our lives. Beyond the fact that he made us, he also paid a very, very high price for us. When we rebelled against him, when we sinned, when we broke our relationship with God, and we rejected him, he loved us so much that he came for us. He was born as a baby needing the help of a mother. He lived a whole life in this broken world. He went through the awkward teenage years. And he went and he died the most painful death mankind has ever created. Willingly. For us. And he did that to redeem us so that we could know him again. To free us from the sin that we chose. First Peter 1, 18-19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He paid for us at great, great price. I mean, we can't even fathom the price. The very blood of God himself. You know, I'm reminded of the story of a young boy who made a model sailboat with his dad. Right? He got all the pieces of wood and he put them together and he, he glued them together and he painted it up and, and made it together. And, and he loved this sailboat. He loved it. Like, you know, when a kid has that one toy, they just want to take it everywhere. Like, that was, that was this boat for this kid. He loved it so much. It was his favorite thing. And then one day, he lost it. And he was just absolutely devastated. It was only a kid losing his toy can be. And then one day, he was walking through town with his family, and he looked up in the window of a pawn shop, and there in the window was his boat. He recognized it. He knew the pain. He knew, he knew it. That was his boat. 
So he ran another store. He was like, that's my boat. That's my boat in the window. And the store owner was like, no, that's my boat. But I'll sell it to you. But being a little kid, he didn't have you know, the money to buy the boat. So he went home, and he asked his parents if there's any extra chores he could do to make some money. And he went around all the neighbors, like, do you need help with anything? Is there anything I can do? Raise a little bit of money. And he did all these things, and he got the money together, and he went back to the store, and he bought his boat. And as he left, he held it in his hands, and he was looking down at it, and he said, I made you, and then I bought you. Now you're doubly mine. See, God made us. And then when we went astray and were lost, he bought us at great cost to himself. The precious blood of Christ. How can we respond but to bow to him? He does have a right in our lives. And beyond the fact that he made us, and beyond the fact that he bought us, he's also the only one actually qualified to run our lives. Now, imagine this with me, real quick. Let's say you're going to go on a trip to California, right? Sounds like a good time. The part that's not on fire, you know. It sounds like a good time, right? And that's pretty far to drive, so you're like, okay, I'm going to go take the plane. So you go down to the airport, you go to security, you do the horse, you get the ticket, you do everything, you get on the plane. And so then you walk on the plane, you go and you go to the cockpit, you're like, all right, everybody out. Nobody's running my life with me. I'm not putting my life in anyone else's hands. I'm flying this plane. Come on. Would we do that? No, right? Why not? Because I don't know how to fly a plane. <laughs> it's not going to go very good. But these guys in this cockpit, these pilots, are trained. They have experience and they know what they're doing. And it would be a lot wiser for me to trust them to get me to California safely than to try to fly the plane myself. Which would not go very well, right? Now think about who God is for a second. Just think about who He is. He knows everything. Everything. Past, present, future, everything that ever was, is, or will be, he knows it all. He has all power. There's absolutely nothing that he cannot do. And he loves us so much that he would give himself for us. He's perfect. He's good. He's never, ever, ever made a mistake. And he never, ever, ever will make a mistake. I've made a lot of mistakes. He knows what's best for us, and He wants what's best for us. And He is perfectly able to give us what's best for us, if we let Him. He's never had a bad motive. He's good, He's faithful. When I mean, this is who we're talking about, this is God. Why wouldn't we trust Him? In Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. See, it would be foolish not to trust God. I mean, I've tried to run my life, and I've made a mess of it. God is so good, and he loves us. Why wouldn't we trust him? We're just like tenants in this parable. Everything we have has been given to us by a good God. And what does he deserve from us? But these tenants, they owe this landowner this harvest. What does God deserve from us? Ourselves. Our lives. He has a right to our lives. But like these tenants, we refuse to give him what he deserves. Rebel against him, rejected him, and our sin and our selfishness cost the cross. That's why Jesus died, because of my sin. That's why he died. And so like these tenants, the question we're left with is, what do we really deserve? What do I really deserve? We love talking about our rights, but what do I really have a right to in front of God? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We're honest and we see ourselves. We deserve death. We deserve separation from God. I deserve death. But he gave himself for us. So that now we can't be restored to him. And why wouldn't we want that? Why wouldn't we want that? 
Why wouldn't we give him what he deserves and let him run our lives and walk with the one who loves us and knows us and made us? Because we want the empty things of this world? They're not worth it. They're not worth it. Money, success, relationships, pleasure, none of those things are going to give us anything that means anything. And they all run out. But Jesus is worth it. We should give him our lives. The world wants to do what's right in their own eyes, but the Bible offers an alternative. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. You know, Jesus didn't just come to be our Savior. He didn't just come to die on the cross and buy us back. He came to be our Lord. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's not just lip service. When it says that, it means the kind of confessing that means a following of life after this. That I recognize the truth and I have to live by it now. That Jesus is Lord. And that word Lord is the Greek word kurios. It means he to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding. That means he has the power to make the choices for me. Means giving him everything. There's nothing held back. There's nothing that he can't point at and say, I don't want you to do this. I want you to do this. Remember who he is. He's good. He knows what's best. And so we have two contrasting ideas to do what's right in our own eyes, like the world around us, or to submit to God. And you know, us Americans, we love our freedom and our rights. We don't really like the word submission very much. It tends to bring to mind ideas of like these images of like a beat dog with his tail between his legs, or like a, a defeated general surrendering in shame, or just weak people. But we've got to remember who God is. And a better picture of submission is found in Matthew 26, 39, which says, And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It was Jesus in the garden praying about the cross. He said, if it be possible, let us find some other way to be on this. Not my will, your will, Father. Jesus models submission for us. And this is what submission is. It's laying down my will for his will. Say, I'm going to lay down my will to choose and go with what you want. I'll lay down what I want. What do you want? And if we're submitted, it'll show when we disagree with God. But I really, really want something, but he wants something else for me. Like Sir James talked about last week. What happens when I want something, but God wants something else? Who gets their way? That shows who our Lord is. If I choose my own will, then I'm not submitted to God at all. You know, it's, it's really easy for us to you know, go with God when it's, it's really fun, happy things, right? Like, uh, like God says he'll bring us freedom or healing. It's like, great, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I want that. Sounds good. But then one of them is like, hey, I don't, I don't want you to go down that career path. I want you to go down this way. I like, but I really want that. What do we do then? Who is really our Lord? Yeah, if Jesus is not our Lord, then we're not Christians. That's what it boils down to. And if anything, anything at all, a good thing or a bad thing, that I will not submit to God, anything where I'm like, ah, I know God wants this for me, but I want that, and I'm going to go with that. Anything like that at all replaces Him as our God. That, that thing has become our God. That's what we do. That's called an idol. And I promise, friends, there is no good God but God. Anything else that you try to put in that place will chew you up and spit you out, leave you broken and empty. It will never satisfy. Only God is good. And whenever He speaks to us, whenever we uncover truth, 
You know, with knowledge comes responsibility. And we have to choose. Am I going to obey or am I going to rebel? And obedience is doing what I'm told and doing it quickly because I love God. You know, sometimes we want to like, well, I'm going to try this way out, even though he said to go this way. And then if it doesn't go very good, go figure. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll come back to what God said. And that's, that's actually not obedience, that's called repentance. And sometimes we need to repent, maybe some of us will need to repent of some things tonight, but, but that's not obedience. Obedience is doing what I'm told and doing it quickly. Because I love God. And this is what it means to be a Christian. This is Christianity. It's not getting a free ticket to heaven. And Jesus is not a ticket scalper sitting outside the pearly gates saying, hey, you want a ticket? Anybody want in? Anybody want in? That's not what he died for. No, being a Christian means giving everything to Jesus. Everything to Him. Letting Him run our lives. You know, I could go up going to church my whole life. Like, going to church like two or three times a week. Doing all the things everyone said you're supposed to do, at least outwardly. But really I was doing those things because I wanted to go to heaven. And I wanted good things from God. But that did nothing to stop me from a life full of sin that eventually erupted out and invisibility. And you know, if, if I'm only at church, if I'm only a Christian because I want to go to heaven, who is that for? What motive is that? Is that not selfish? That's seeking God's hand, the things He can give, but it's not seeking His heart, seeking Him Himself. And there's no relationship there. You know, we talked several weeks back about the treasure in a field that's worth everything. And the treasure is not heaven. It's Jesus. It's not the things he can give me. It's him. He is worth everything. Why don't we come to Jesus? Was it for what he can give us? Because he is worth it. We want him or the blessings that he offers. You know, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, this is everybody's favorite passage. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's called obedience. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name? And then will I appear to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. Why do we come to Jesus? Ugh. Many who claim to be Christians are only Christians because they want to go to heaven, because they want something from God. After his hand and not his heart. And you know, I grew up this way, going to church my whole life because I wanted God to bless me. And I, I wanted to go to heaven, and then I got to college, and I totally turned my back on it. Because I saw a lot of things that seemed really enticing, and I really wanted them, so I just chased them. And I was living selfishly, and I was living in sin, and I hurt people living that way. It hurt people. And it left me empty and broken. And a small group leader went out of his way to fight for me and love me, and show me what it really means to walk with Jesus. And I had a moment when I actually saw my sin. And I saw what I was doing. And I realized I actually deserve hell. I deserve it. But he took it for me. What can I do but just say, Jesus, my life's a mess, but you can have it. And that's Christianity. It's not saying a prayer so I can get to heaven. It's bowing before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and saying, here is all that I am, what little I am. You can do what you want with it, Lord, because only you are worthy of it. That's what it means to be a Christian. To bow down to Jesus and give him our lives and make him our Lord. Is Jesus our Lord? It's only nothing back. Nothing. No relationship, no sin, no 
career aspiration, no financial resources, nothing. We give it all to him. So you can do with this whatever you want to do with it. I trust you. Jesus must be the one. If we do things for God to gain things from him, instead of because he alone is worthy and he's not our Lord, then we're not Christian. But someone was like to say, you know, yeah, I'll serve God as, as long as I can have this too. But just let me have this and, and I'll do whatever you want, right? This pleasure, this financial stability, this success, this career, this relationship. We can't hold anything back from Jesus. Anything that we will not give to God is an idol. It's become our God. And this is what Israel used to do when they would turn their back on God. It's called secretism. You know, the, the Old Testament's full of Israel turning away and going astray. And it wouldn't that they would just like stop going to the temple. Not that they would stop like sacrificing to God and doing all the things they're supposed to do. But they'd also then go over to Baal. Or Moloch or Asherah or one of these other deities. And they'd go worship there too. So they'd go worship God, and then they'd have their other thing on the side. And the Lord called them adulterous for this. Jesus said in Matthew 6, and you cannot serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. You can't do it. You can't serve God and something else. Jesus is either Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. Either he's completely Lord of everything, or he's not. Is there anything in our lives that we wouldn't trust Him with? Because we sit here, there's, there's the one thing that we just kind of dread, like, oh, please don't, please don't ask for that. Please don't ask for that. Or Jimmy, you can go ahead and come back down for moving towards your clothes. Is there anything in our lives that competes with Jesus to be our Lord? Let's give it to Him tonight. Let's trust Him. Let's say, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to follow Jesus and this, Jesus and pleasure, Jesus and money, Jesus and just Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Because he's worth it. What are the things that stand between us and Jesus? What are the things we don't want to let go of? Maybe for some of us it's pornography. You know, everything about porn breaks God's heart. Everything about it. It's an awful thing. It's not innocent. It's not harmless. It twists our minds. It twists our hearts. And beyond that, there are millions of lives ruined by it. The amount of broken marriages and broken homes that come back to this. Not to mention the fact that the sex trafficking in our world is huge. And so much of that goes to feed this massive industry. We can't be Christians who partake in evil. Who delight in what breaks God's heart. And he weeps over this. If it's in our lives, it's got to go. It's got to go. Whatever it takes. Maybe we've got a relationship in our lives. And we know it's not. And we know it's not right. Maybe we need to lay that down. Or maybe you're, you're here and you're studying a major and you're, you're chasing a career path and you never once ask God, what do you think about this? What do you want me to do with my life? Have we asked him that question? Are we afraid to ask him that question? Maybe it's money. And maybe, you know, we're college students, maybe we don't even have much money, but it's like what we have, we cling to so tightly. Even though, you know, God has infinite storehouses and has promised, He's promised to provide everything we need if we trust Him. That's a promise in the Bible. There's not many where He says, test me. But He said, test me on that. If you trust God, He's promised to provide what you need. And we, we think so tightly that one is like, I can't, I can't give God. I, don't, I barely have enough to make it by. But maybe that's what he wants. Maybe he wants us to, to put some of our money in the kingdom, to tithe, to support a missionary. And the Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Is any of our treasure in the kingdom? Is any of it in advancing God's kingdom? 
You know, when you read the Bible, you see so many stories like the widow of Zarephath who had just enough flour and oil left at the start of a famine that she could make one meal for her and her son. And then they were going to starve. But God sent Elijah and he asked, can you, can you feed me? And she had just enough for one meal, but she gave it to him. And then you know what? It didn't run out. And so she fed her and her son. And then you know what? It didn't run out. And this little bit of flour, this little bit of oil, just enough for one meal, lasted through the entire famine for months until they were able to get more. We see Jesus feed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. And there's 12 baskets of leftovers. <laughs> if there's no limit to what God can provide, that he's promised to provide, we can trust him. We can trust him. Is there anything in our lives that competes with God to be our Lord? If there is, let's lay it down tonight at the cross. Say, I don't want this anymore, Jesus. I just want to do whatever you want. Your will. Your will, Jesus. I want you to be my Lord. No more Jesus and Anna. Just Jesus. And you know, God gives us community because we can help each other in this. There's going to be things right now that he's going to just, for some of us, there's things right now and he's pointing at it. And the Holy Spirit's got his finger on some things in our hearts and he's saying, I need you to forgive this to me. I need you to trust me with this, son, daughter. I need you to trust me with this. And it's hard because we don't want to. But he's good. And he knows what's best for us. And he always has better things in store. And there's things that he's put his finger on. And you know, we're going to come, we're going to meet with him, and we're going to pray. And afterwards, we can help each other walk this out. And maybe some of us need to, need to get some sin out of our lives. Maybe we need to give up a computer. Maybe we need to give up a phone. There's nothing wrong with a flip phone. Whatever it takes. Maybe some of us need to cut a relationship out of our lives that we know is not honoring God. And trust that he's good and he has better for us. Maybe some of us need to ask, God, what do, you, what do you want me to do with my life? This major, this career path I'm pursuing, is this what you want from me? And be willing to lay it down if he asks us to. Maybe some of us need to give. Say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to trust you with my money. And it's scary because I don't know, I don't have much, but I'm going to trust you with it. You say you'll provide. I'm going to trust you. We can walk this out together. Our worship team is going to lead us in some songs, and as they do, let's meet with Jesus. You can come find a space up here at the front. You can go to the back, the side. You can sit right in your seat, but let's meet with Jesus. Let's get honest with him. Let's ask the Lord, is there anything that's keeping me from you? I'm giving you everything like you deserve. And let's lay it down. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, Lord. God, we thank you that you made us and you provided for us and you've given us so much. You've blessed us so much, God. And you came for us and you paid with your very blood for us. And Lord, we recognize that you are good and you are faithful and you are true. And Lord, you deserve all that we are. You deserve all that we are and we trust you, God. Would you help us to walk with you? Would you help us, Jesus, to lay down the things that we're having a hard time laying down? Would you give us the strength and the grace to do it, Jesus? To worship you and you only. To follow you because you're worth it, Jesus. God, would you speak to us? Would you show us? Would you help us? We love you, Jesus. We trust you.